to hear what it's uttering in our, in our being. And Father, this morning my prayer is that you will help me to deliver this the way you want me to deliver this. Because I've got many ideas. But my ideas are not your ideas. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. But Father, I pray this morning that you will help me and you'll help us to be able to hear, to be able to listen what the Spirit is uttering in our lives. And we are in your presence right now. We can feel the presence of Jesus. We're not saying this because we're trying to invoke an emotion. We're saying this because we know that you are here. We know that you are busy moving. We know that you are doing what we cannot do, what we cannot see, but you are doing something. And Father, we pray that you will continue to do what you are doing, that you will continue to change and continue to mold us the way you want us to be. So Father, in my own joking way, I want to say, let's take a journey. Father, I, I remember years ago you saying to somebody, you, you said to me, you need to walk with Jesus when you preach. You need to talk with Jesus when you talk. Because he needs to lead you. Because when you follow him and you move with him, you move with authority, you move with power. But when you move in your own ability, you move out of that situation. So Father, I want to move with your ability as a son. I want to move with your ability as a son. And Father, as daughters, we want to move with your ability. We want to step with your ability. We want to see the things that we don't understand happen because we're moving with you. We're not moving with ourselves, but we are moving with you. We are stepping with you. We are hearing you and we are obeying you. And when we do that, the, hell, the, the gates of hell tremble because something is happening. Something is changing because we're walking with you. Father, we walk too many places alone and not with you. We need to walk with you. We need to go with you. We need to sit with you. We need to hear what you are saying and just walk with that. So Father, help me this morning. I, I, I need your help this morning. Number one, to keep it together. And number two, to hear your voice. Because when we move with you, and we obey your voice, things change. So we give you the glory. Woo, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I wasn't kidding. When I was saying God's going to help me keep it together this morning, um, I want to share with you something that I'm dealing with and that I believe by sharing this with you, hopefully it will mean something to you and hopefully it will get you to a place where you can say, hey, you know, maybe I need to hear that. Maybe, maybe God's trying to tell me something this morning. Um, I was in a battle preparing this message because I had a title that I wasn't going to use. <laughs> and my wife said to me, you cannot use that title. If you use that title, people are going to think you're completely off the road. And I said, why, babe? She said, well, listen to the title. And I, so the title that was, that was given to you is the biggest battle of your life is fought in the darkness of your mind. Which is absolutely true. It's, it's a fact, the, the biggest battle. I can see you all going, what was the real title? We want to know. <laughs> Half of you are just, 90% of you are probably just going, I don't know what he's talking about, I just want the title. Just give me the other title. <laughs> you want to know what the other title would have been? 
The other title would have been, I've been thinking, I'm coming out. <laughs> there we go. That's why we didn't use that one. <laughs> Do you know what consumes your mind controls you? What consumes your mind controls you. Am I in the right place this morning? What consumes your mind controls you. And you know what's the worst about this, about, about this whole thing is that we all struggle with this. We all struggle with this. I want you to touch the person next to you. And I want you to say the following to them. He will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Come on. That, that's God's word. That's not my... I mean, I wish I could write that good. I wish I could write that good. But yeah. He will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. You see, God doesn't want to deal with your symptoms. We, we love to deal with symptoms. Doctors want to know what your symptoms are. They, you know why they ask what your symptoms are? Because they want to try and figure out what's the root problem. We focus so much on the symptoms of a situation. We don't focus on the root. And we need to understand that God isn't interested in the symptom. That doesn't mean He's not interested in you, but He's not interested in the symptom. He's interested in what caused that symptom. Where did it come from? Where, where, where did this happen? And you know what really gets to me about the mind? That it starts with a thought. It literally starts with a thought. And for some reason that thought, that, that minute little, non-important little thought, consumes you. Come on, it, it starts with a little thought like this. Like, and it consumes you. It starts with a question or he'll come to you because what does the enemy do? I've said this before, I'm going to repeat this. He walks around like a roaring lion because he's trying to imitate God, but he's not God. And he walks around and he starts with a little thought. Andrew, you didn't pray enough this week. It's a thought. It's just a simple thought. But that little simple thought becomes your mountain. It becomes the thing that you are so worried about and so concerned about that nothing else in your life matters anymore because this thought is consuming your mind. Am I, am I the only one that... Uh, it can be something so simple. But it becomes something that big. And if we can capture that thought at the right moment, before it even enters, if you can get to that thought before it enters your mind or, or, or takes hold of you, that is what our identity of sons and daughters are about. I was sitting in worship this morning, busy worshiping, and I said to the Father, these are my words. Holy Spirit, please, you've got to help me this morning. Holy Spirit, please, you, you've got to help me. Holy Spirit, are you there? You need to help me this morning. Holy Spirit, come on, you need to help me this morning. Holy Spirit, that, that's literally what I was praying. Holy Spirit, you need to help me. Holy Spirit, you need to help me. Holy Spirit, and you know what God said to me? You're sounding like an orphan. I'm like, <laughs> sorry. I'm like, what do you mean, God? He says, you're sounding like an orphan. Did you prepare? Yes. Come on. Are you ready? Yes. So just go do it and stop asking. Because you've asked. We've got to stop thinking like orphans and start living like sons and daughters. The enemy wants to isolate you because he wants you to become an orphan. He wants you to feel alone. He wants you to think that you're not important. And that's why he bombards you with these thoughts because he wants you to get isolated and separated from the tribe. From the group, from the people. Because what is the first thing we do when we go into some form of depression or some form of, of worry or concern? What is the first thing we do? We isolate. I'm not going to church this morning. I, I, just, I don't feel holy. No, I, I just don't feel it. I don't feel... I cannot... I'm too emotional. I cannot be around people. It's too much. 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 It's too
too much. I just can't do it this morning. Now, can I can I share can I be can I share something? Be a little bit blunt, but share something. I myself am going through a tremendous struggle right now. Mm, Got to suck it up. <laughs> I'm going through a tremendous struggle myself right now, where we don't know how things are going to look today. Now, like Pam said a few few months ago, me and Katie are fine. The kids are fine. There's nothing like that. It's just a personal matter we're dealing with in our family. Um, oh, I'm about to tell you. My, my wife, my ex-wife has got this great idea of moving my son to the States. And it has affected me on a very tremendous big level. We're really fighting it. But it, 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 it affects you. It affects you. If you can tell me when you go through something and it doesn't affect you, I would like to get whatever you have because I ain't there yet. So please come afterwards or right now, come pray for me and give me what you got because I want that but I don't got it yet. But what I do know is that when all of this stuff happened and all these bombs exploded, I still needed to preach. I couldn't just say, Amory, you need to take that weekend. Okay. Because when God gives you something to do, you cannot back down because the enemy has called you for something and he wants you to not believe in yourself anymore because if he can get you not to believe in yourself, you're going to give up. Let me tell you something. When you're called to do something for God, no matter how big, no matter how small, the enemy is going to tell you and throw things at you like you've never seen them come before because he wants to distract your mind. But if he can distract your mind, he's won the battle. That's what he wants you to do. Now, for those of you who don't know, I have the wonderful gift of ADHD. Yes, you know. I have the wonderful gift of ADHD. Now, I have to say this. My wife doesn't know, but, but I have a wonderful wife. Yes, you do. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. No good, you made me laugh. I thought I was going to cry. <laughs> because she can take all my ADHD and she can do all my crazy habits and still love me anyway. And I went through a period in my life that was very dark where I was told by people, and I'm not going to get, that detail is not important, but then I want you to hear this, where people told me that because you've got this, you will never be trustworthy. Because you've got this, you'll never achieve anything. Because you've got this, you're weird. Because you've got this, 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 this. And because you've got that, this. And because of this, this. And it just kept on going. And you've got depression. And you've got anxiety. And you've got this and this. Because you've got that. Because all of this links. ADHD links to this and that links to that. You know, I'm talking really fast. ADHD. It links to all of these things. And that's why you'll never achieve anything. You know what I'd like to do to those people today? Right. I'd like to say, watch this space. Come on. Not because it's me. <laughs> because when he enters the room. Now, now, some of you think I'm preaching really good because hyper focus. <laughs> I've been preaching for 16, 17 years. I was only diagnosed with ADHD about six years ago. I've been preaching because when the Holy Spirit grabs hold of me, he grabs hold of this. And he takes this really weird lemon and he does something to it and I can focus on a subject and I can bring a word because I'm not reliant on my own brain. I'm reliant on the Holy Spirit that is leading me. And if we have the Holy Spirit leading us and obeying His voice, we will do great things. But the moment you move away from Him, that's when things fall apart. Because He's our strength. He's the, he's the glue that keeps us together. Now, just for, the, for those of you who are wondering, what are the superpowers of ADHD? Here we go. Number one, I'm creative and spontaneous. Sure. <laughs> I'm, asto I'm an astounding problem solver. I have endless amounts of energy. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. But yeah, I wouldn't say that. And of course, my special ability is hyperfocus. But, as wonderful as this ability is. Now, I've got ADHD. Some of you probably don't. Most of you don't. How many of you worry about something? Come on, how many of you worry about stuff? Okay. If you don't, then you need to come pray for me. 
with my wonderful ADHD hyperfocus ability, I can hyperfocus on anything. Yeah. That too. That too. Something bad's coming. Oh Lord Jesus. Oh no. We need to batten down the hatches. We need to we need to we need to we need to do this. And my beautiful, amazing wife will say to me, Who are you trusting? And I'm like, Ouch, okay, honey, I got it. Because that's the negative side of it, the hyper focused side. And all of you laughed at my title, just wait, just wait. So, I want to I touch on something this morning that. I think it's very relevant, and, and I want to throw this in. You cannot have a positive life and a negative mind. I would love to see anybody that has a positive life and a negative mind. Because a lot of the celebrities and a lot of these people that we see in board, they all are wonderful, but half of them have drug issues, half of them have committed suicide or are just in a bad place because there's something going on up here. They're, they're doing everything they can to try and find all of us trying to find a place where we fit in. Trying to find a place where people accept us. Thank God I found this church that has, that has accepted me and ADHD and all. But you need to understand this morning that you cannot have a positive life and a negative mind. The two don't walk hand in hand. And that is why in the beginning I asked you to say to the person next to you, you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. I want to read a scripture to you. And now we're really, now we're really going to get going. In Romans 7 verse 25, I'm just going to read you the scripture. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. It is with the mind that we praise God. It is with the mind that we praise God. The mind is the battleground. It is the greatest place of conflict is in the mind. That is why we have people who go to bed early at night but wake up tired the next morning. They get eight hours of sleep but they're still tired. They're still exhausted. They still have no energy because your mind has not rested but your body has. Your mind's been in the warfare all night long. You're rolling in your bed. You wake up the next morning. You look at your bed. Your husband looks at you. Or your wife looks at you and goes, What were you doing last night? Why is the bed look like it's because your mind is being in a war. Your mind is in a battle. It's fighting something. It's, it's really dealing with something that you don't understand. But in your subconscious, there's a battle going on. Because the enemy's after your mind. He wants to see you quit. He wants to give you surrender. He wants to put anxiety on you. He wants to put depression on you. He wants to put all these things on you because he wants you out of the game. He doesn't want you in the game anymore. You see, the battle is not. There are more people in this room today that have battled in their minds than in their finances. There are more, I want to say that again because we need to hear that. There are more people today having problems in their minds their problems in their finances. You see, he's not after your checkbook. He's not after your savings account. He's after your mind. He's after your noggin. He wants that because that is what we serve the Lord with. And, and, and oh, I don't I want to say it, but it's so corny, but I'm going to anyway. Oh, here we go. You can, you can take it, you can, you can look at it, wait, let me, let me get this right, I want to say this right, it's just not going to come right. You can whip it out of your checkbook, you can whip it out of your savings account, you can whip it out of your job everywhere, but you've got to drive those thoughts out of your mind. They've got to get out of your mind. You can try and get it out of your mind, your, you can think that it's after your money, it's after all of those things, he's not. He's after this. You can write a check to try and fix the problems. You can go into your savings account to try and pay the, pay the thing that you, that you need to pay and think that will solve your problem, but it's in your mind. That's where it is and that's what we've got to deal with. That's the place where the greatest conflict happens. It's in the mind. Now, now I want to say this. How many of you sometimes are anxious? 
Okay, that will be on my spot hands. You're anxious about something that hasn't even happened. You're anxious about something that hasn't even happened. Now, now, I'm talking to myself more than to you this morning. And what I love the most about this, studies have proven that 90% of the things that you're anxious about never happen. 90%. But we focus on the 10%. Because it could happen. See, he wants to rob you of your joy. How does he do that? By attacking your mind. Getting you to start thinking negatively. That's what he wants to do. Now, I did a bit of research. Can I read you what I found? Do you want to know what anxiety does to the brain? Pathological anxiety and chronic stress leads to a structural degeneration and impaired function of the hippocampus and the PVC, which may account to the increased risk of developing neurocystic disorders, including depression and dementia. It's after your mind. He wants to worry you to death. That's literally what it's saying. You're going to worry to death. But listen to this. What happens when we worship God with the mind? Oh, this is good stuff. Research has found that when we worship God, there is an increase in the BNF, which is a neurostimulator that helps us grow healthy brain cells. It is with the mind that I serve the Lord. That's my new motto from now on. God renew. That's why it says He renews your mind. Because when we worship Him, He's renewing all the time. When you're standing in worship, why do you think it's hard for you to stand in worship at times? Because the enemy goes, I want to distract you, but if you start worshiping God, your mind's going to start getting renewed. I've got to get you to think negative. I've got to get you to stop thinking positively. I've got to do that. Now, if you have your Bibles with me, I'm going to read. I want to go to Luke 13. This is our main scripture that I'm going to read, be reading this morning. It's Luke 13, verse 10. Um, and the topic is Jesus healed the crippled woman on the Sabbath. Okay, everybody ready? All right, here we go. On the Sabbath, Jesus was, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues. And a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to, her, said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Then he put his hands on her and immediately she straightened up and praised God. Indignant because Jesus had healed her on the Sabbath, doesn't that sound so religious? The synagogue leader said to the people, There are six days of work. So come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. Now, if I was that woman and they said that to me after I got healed, they would not be walking out of there. <laughs> the Lord answered him, You hypocrites! Doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or donkey from a stall and lead it to give it water? Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set, free of a be set free on the Sabbath day from what has bound her. When he said this, all the opponents were humiliated, but the people were delighted with all the wonderful things he was doing. 18 years. Not five, not six, not seven, 18 18 long years, this woman was struggling with something. I can guarantee you that the church that she was in, or the, or the place that she went to, probably some, they were talking about her. Oh, here she is again. Here she comes again. Really, you're here again. You've been here like for 18 years. Here she comes again. Anne Marie, she's here again. Mike, can't the leadership do something, please? 18 years, this woman clearly doesn't get the message. It's true. You can laugh all you want, but you know it's true. I want to add something to what Patty said right in the beginning this morning. And now I'm going to blow you all away with my title. She didn't feel like coming to church. No, she did. She kept on coming. She kept on coming. She never once said, 
Do I feel like coming to church? Something inside of her said, I'm going to keep on going because there was a thought in her mind that if I keep on going, something has to change. I've seen too many people around me change. I cannot just sit here for 18 years and just give up. I've got to keep on pushing. I want to tell you, there are people sitting in this room that are dealing with things that have been going on for years. I want to encourage you right now, do not stop pushing. Do not give up. Because God is the one holding at the back saying, I ain't say quit yet. I want to tell you this morning, you've got to keep on pushing. You've got to keep on pushing. For 18 years. And then, I'm going to say something now. This might sound not very nice. But then you have people that come to you. I've been standing in line for five minutes. Why am I waiting so long? I'm just going to preach it now. You're not on that level then. You're not on that level. This woman is on a level that none of us are on. Because she has kept on going for 18 years. Not five minutes in a queue that took too long. 18 years. How many of you are dealing with things in your mind that you've been praying for God to do something, but it just sits there all the time? But why do you keep on going? I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Come on, come on, why? why? You can tell me. Who can come on? I, I've read this. I'm, come on, let's see if anybody's paid attention. He will keep those in perfect peace. It's mine, I said on him. I guarantee you this woman was working, walking on a level that nobody else understood. We don't know anything about her. We just know she kept on going. We just know she kept on pushing. And I don't know if they had the father heart message back then, but my good grief, this woman must have had something. Because to go on going for 18 years, there's got to be something inside of you that says, my father loves me because I'm carrying it. I'm not stopping. 18 years. Oh, now it's going to get really good. A thought is a powerful thing because it invokes a response. A thought is a powerful thing because it invokes a response. What is your response when the negative thoughts come? But there has to be a response. When I put my hand on a, on, a warm, on a warm stove, I can't go, I'm going to think about this for a while. Mm. Mm. No, there has to be a response. There has to be an action. There has to be something that happens. You cannot, now, now I'm talking about this woman now. I want to talk about the woman for a second. You cannot let people's opinion about you determine who you think you are. Come on. We cannot let people's opinions determine who we are in God's eyes. But we do. Because for a minute we forget we're sons and daughters. And then we get distracted. Did you hear what they said to me at church today? And instead of us saying, honey, before, or, or baby, or snookums, or cuddly bear, before you get upset, are you a son or are you, are you a son and daughter of God? Come on. Yes, I am. Well, then suck it up and move on. <laughs> suck it up and move on. That's right. That's good. Because nobody else's opinion is going to matter. Whose opinion matters? God. Oh, whose? God. God. Oh, oh, God's actually in the equation then. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> but that's how we act sometimes. Yes. God, God, God's actually, you know, we, we sometimes think that. But I want to go back to the scripture. I want to read something else. It says, And Jesus saw her. Do you know that Jesus sees you today? I played this game with God many times. I'm honest. I'm being, I'm being very honest this morning. I've played this game with God many times. I go to church and I go, I've got a problem. Let's see if somebody can notice. And I'll sit there. Anybody? Any, come on, come on. Somebody, somebody here has got a prophetic gift. They can pick up something's going on with me. Doesn't matter if anybody else picks it up, but I can tell you who does. The Father is watching you. He can see things that others can't see. And He saw her. He saw her. 
It doesn't say he, Jesus walked around and just went, oh, you over there, come here. He saw her. What did he see? He saw a need. He saw a need. He saw somebody that needed him. And he's been struggling for a long time. He saw somebody that was struggling for a long time. But she had a fault. And her fault was, I was not going to stop going until something happened. But I'm going to come out of this. I'll have my title now. I had a fault. And that fault told me, you're coming out of this. You see, we have a fault. You have a fault going on right now. This guy's totally crazy. We should get rid of him right away. You have a fault going on right now. And what are you doing with that fault? What is that fault doing to you? Because if I bring that thought to Jesus and I look at this little scripture, I'm going to read it again by repetition. You, know. you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Why do you think it says that? Because the enemy wanted this woman not to be steadfast. He didn't, he didn't want her to keep on believing God. And that's why people talked about her. That's why people were making fun of her. Because that's all part of the enemy's plan, to get you to lose your faith and your hope and trust in him. He sees everything in you. He sees exactly what you're going through right now. I, I want to pronounce it right to you. You've got the whole English, you're going to help me now. I'm Afrikaans, so you're going to help me now. The Word of God. It is... And it's an integrated thing. The Word of God is integrated. Does that make sense? Am I saying it right? When we listen to the Word of God and we read the Word of God, what happens? But what was that, Amory? Why? Because it's truth. The Word of God is the truth. The Word of the enemy is a lie. If you measure up the Word of God to the situation you're going through right now, what do you see? See, this is, where, this, is, this is the part where you go, which one am I looking at? This is the moment. This, is the, this was this woman's 18-year-long journey. I guarantee you she got up every morning going, ah, I don't feel like it. But I don't feel like it. I'm going to trust the Word. I'm going to go. And if she didn't go that morning, she would have missed her healing. If she did not obey that morning, she would have missed her healing. She would have missed what God wanted to do. She would have missed what God was trying to do. This woman was paralyzed for 18 years. Sometimes the situations we are in paralyze us. It paralyzes our finances, it paralyzes everything. It just puts us in a state of absolute destruction. Where we have no hope. I have been there. So I'm not saying this because, I'm not talking about this because I have, because I don't have the shirt and I can't wear it. I'm, I'm probably going to get a lot more of those shirts. But, but the point is, it's trying to paralyze you. Because a negative thought and a negative mind is from the enemy. And it's trying to paralyze you and trying to let you Give up on what you know. But the moment you measure up the thought that you have with the Word of God, the two cannot be in the same room. Because truth outshines darkness. Nowhere in the Bible do, do I read, nowhere do I read that there's any place in the Bible where darkness overcame. I only read there was light always. There was light always. There was always light. You see, this woman who was struggling, if you read it in the King James Version, it says, and she was loosed from her disease. She was loosed. Not, she was going to maybe get loosed. Not, this might happen. She was loosed immediately. Because when God speaks a word, Everything else doesn't matter. Because His Word is truth and light and justice. 
His truth is the thing that keeps us going. His truth is the thing that no matter what we look at, it is the thing that shines into that darkest hour of your life and says, don't give up. Oh, let me tell you. I look, I look, I look good now and I, and I sound good. I was emotional for you about, about a half an hour ago. Because it's hard. I'm not telling you, it's oh, it's going to be sunshine and roses and your brain's going to go, woo, praise the Lord, everything's fine now. It's going to be a journey. But the more you move to Him and the more you obey His voice, the more the light's going to come in. Now I've kept the beast for last. Remember we've been reading that scripture this whole morning. We've been, I've we already read that more. We've been reading um, Isaiah 26 verse 3 the whole morning. We've been saying it like a hundred times. I want to read it to you again and I want to tell you something about this. You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Okay, be ready to hear something amazing. Have you ever taken the word peace and go and look what it means in the old Hebrew? If you take the, old, if you take the word peace and you go look at the ancient Hebrew, every letter in the Hebrew text means something. It's sometimes a picture, or sometimes, but it means something. So a friend of mine that, that I know really well, me and him were talking about this, and he said to me, if you go look at what the word peace actually means, according to the old Hebrew text and all of that. You want to know what that means? Because yeah. you're going to look at that scripture so much differently from now on. You're going to go, if you don't go, whoa now, then I need to seriously pray for all of you. The definition of the word peace in the Bible means the following. Woo! <laughs> to destroy the authority that established this order. Yes. <laughs> I need to know that again. Destroy the authority that has established this order. Should I read that to you again? I'll read it again. Some of you are looking at me going. No, this order. This order. Destroy the authority that establishes this order. So when we start praying peace of God over our mind, Somebody's getting excited with Jesus. You know what that means? It means the ruler of the universe is saying, what is causing you problems? Because I will send my spirit there and I will destroy whatever is, ordered, what that is, whatever is causing this disorder. You know what I've been praying the last few weeks? Father, did your peace just come in my situation? Because it's going to destroy the disorder. You have got to get to a place where you realize when we, when we say these words, when we say He will keep in perfect peace, He's saying, whatever you're facing in your mind, I'm going to destroy it if it's causing any disorder. He wants to destroy that thing. He doesn't want to make friends with it. He doesn't want to invite it over for coffee. He doesn't want to sit down and say, so what were you thinking? He wants to say, that thought, I'm going to destroy it because it's not from me. I'm going to take it. I'm going to rip it out. I'm going to demolish it. I'm going to destroy it. And when God destroys something, it's gone. It doesn't exist anymore. Now, a couple of years ago, this was 16, 17, 20 years ago, when I was a very young, young, strapping young man, serving Jesus and looking good, and in the Pentecostal church, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Um, there was a man who came to visit our church. And I want you to remember these words in this story. I'm losing my notes. Destroy the authority that establishes this order. Now, here we go. This man and his wife had a, baby, had a little girl, or not a little girl, had a, had a woman, had a daughter. And this daughter was one night going out and she was in a car accident. And it was a terrible car accident, it was a really bad accident. The parents get to the hospital and they're like, 
where's our daughter? What, no, we, we've just got a call. We've got to be here. We're here. What's going on? Is she okay? What's going on? The doctors called him aside. Now, I want you to remember what I've been speaking about this morning. Okay, remember what I've been speaking about. The doctors call her in and they say, we have bad news. Your daughter has very serious brain damage and she will never be normal again. The daughter you knew, you will never know again. There is no hope for her. The best thing you do with her is take her home after when, when we're done doing all the tests and everything. You take her home and give her as much of a comfortable life as you can. She will probably never be able to show emotion. She will probably never be able to make eye contact. But she will be your daughter still, but not the daughter you knew. Now, I want to ask you this morning, if a doctor came and told you that, how would you feel? I mean, you cannot tell me you're going to go, well, I'm going to read the Word of God now. It's going to hit you hard. It's going to, it's going, there's a, when we hear these things, it's a shock at first. It's a shock of, what have I just heard? In your mind, when things go happen in your mind, this is a, I want to use this as a practical, oh, this is a true example, but to use this. The parents took the, little, took the daughter home. I keep on saying little girl, but I'm a wonderful little girl. Um, and they took her home. Months went past, years went past. And you know what the parents would do every day? They would feed her and they would sit with her. The father would go sit. He would literally go sit with her. Oh, wait, I better do it on this side. It's going to be weird. He'll go sit with her. He'll take her hand and he'll say, Honey, one day we know you're going to come out of this. We know. And he would feed her every day. He would do that every day. And if that doesn't rip your heart, I don't know what will. But every day. Because he said, I'm not giving up. Because no matter what the challenge is, I'm not giving up. I know that my God can do anything, even in this situation that is so hard. And, as I said, years went by. Nothing. They didn't go to an evangelist. They didn't go to Benny Hinn's healing service. They didn't go to the church around the corner that prayed for the sick and healed them with oil and whatever they do. They, they, they didn't go there. They just kept her at home and they kept on praying and they kept on praying and they just kept on saying, what? and the father's words to her every day was, honey, one day you're going to come out of this. I know my father. I know what he can do. Every day. And one day he goes to her again. And they're sitting at the table. They're having dinner. Remember the doctor's words. She will never be able to show emotion. She will never be able to make eye contact. She is she's not herself anymore. And he came to her one day again. And he took her by the hand. And he said, honey, let's have dinner. They prayed. And he took her hand. And he said, honey, one day you're going to come out. And as the father, before the father could even finish those words, her eyes suddenly met the dad's. And tears started running down her eyes. And she said the following, I mean, she didn't say it as perfect as I'm saying it now. Please remember this somebody that's been in a state for years. But these were the words she said. I've heard your voice calling me every day for the last couple of years saying, I'm going to come out. Every day I heard you saying, I'm going to come out. Every day I heard you saying to me, I'm going to come out. And today I'm coming out. Today you're, God, she, and her dad said, what happened? How did this, the doctors are, what? How, what? Are you tricking us? Is this the right girl? And she said, she was in darkness. But then the light came in. She was in darkness. But then the light came in. And to destroy the authority that establishes disorder. And the father stepped in. And he said, I have heard the cries of the people of God. I'm about to step in. I'm about to step in and I'm about to set free. I'm about to step in and I'm about to set free. And this girl was, I want to use the words instantly. Came back. 18 years, instantly, she came back. The Word of God has not changed. The Word of God is, has not changed at all. It's still the same Word that we've been reading for years. But when it gives us peace, that's why it says it's peace that surpasses all understanding. We don't understand it because we cannot see what He's doing in the Spirit. We cannot. My mom was somebody that. Lord Jesus, I, I still don't know how she stayed calm all the time. 
But my friend told me this, and me and him spoke about it, I went, I think I actually know what my mom perceived calm all these years. Because she understood, maybe didn't understand it exactly, but it destroyed the authority that causes disorder. Joanna, God's about to do something new in your life. God is about to set a new foundation in your life. He's about to destroy some things that have, kept you, that have been keeping you distracted. He's about to step in and change some things. He's about to just remove things that have been blocking you from hearing what you want to hear and what you want to do. And I just hear the Father saying, be ready, but I'm about to make you a daughter like you've never been before. I'm going to take all the shame away, I'm going to take all the pain away, and I'm going to show you that you are my daughter that I love. Because the Father loves you. No matter what the enemy has told you, the Father loves you. And he wants you to hear this morning the word peace over your life. The word peace. And as I'm looking at you, and I don't want to sound strange or funny to the congregation, but as I'm sat looking at you, I can sense the Father putting his hand on you saying, I'm with you right now. And I'm about to destroy that which is called you disorder. He's about to destroy that which is called this disorder. Now, we normally have a way that we do things in church, and I think it's wonderful. We have our preaching. So I want to ask the preaching to come up right now. If you don't mind, if you can just come to the front of the preaching. If you guys could just come forward. Aaron, would you mind playing on your guitar a little bit, just for like two minutes? I've got to get done. My time's running out, but I just want to do this very quickly. I feel that when we play an instrument, it brings a different kind of anointing to the circuit. It brings an anointing to it. But, but I want to say to you this morning, the Father is here. And the Father cares about your well-being. He doesn't want you to worry yourself to death. But that's what the enemy wants to do. He doesn't want you to give up on your dream. But that's what the enemy wants to do. He wants to make you quit, give up on your dream. But he wants to attack your mind and make you give up. And I'm going to make this very short. I'm not going to stretch this out. As Aaron is playing, I want you to just close your eyes for a minute where you are. Just where you are for a minute, just close your eyes and allow the Father to just love on you right now for a minute. Just let him love on you for a minute. Just let him be your dad. And as I'm speaking, I just want you to listen to the words I'm saying. Imagine for a minute that problem that you have is right in front of you right now. That situation that you're dealing with in front of you right now. That thing that is keeping you captive in front of you right now. That's fear, whatever it is, in front of you right now. And I want you to imagine for a minute your father putting his hand on your shoulder. Just putting his hand on your shoulder saying, I've got this. No matter how crazy it sounds, he's got this. He's got you. I'm going to do a prayer and then if you want prayer this morning, I want to welcome you to come up and get prayer. But don't leave here with the enemy still telling you what to think and what to do. And how to live your life. Because the Father this morning is saying, I'm destroying the disorder. I'm bringing order. So Father, we pray this morning. No matter what we are facing right now. That Father, if we have to jump up a seat and we have to run, if we have to crawl, whatever we have to do to get to you this morning, that we'll do that. Because Father, we want the peace that surpasses all understanding. We want the peace that surpasses all understanding. And Father, maybe there's stuff in our life going on right now where we, where we don't feel the peace in that place. Father, as, as we end off, I want to pray that if there's anybody here this morning that's saying, I need peace. Like that woman, for 18 years, maybe six, maybe seven, maybe eight years, I don't know how many years you've been struggling. But the Father this morning is saying, I want to set you free. I want to set you free from what you're facing. So Father, I pray as we end off that if there's anybody here this morning that needs your help, 
That they will have boldness given by your Holy Spirit. That they will stand. And that they will come and realize that you have come to set the captives free. In Jesus' mighty name.